All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're in Revelation, the fourth chapter. Uh, let me see, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. So, let me see, it's just 11 verses. So I'm going to read that, and then we're just going to break that down. Uh, you know, uh, John has has already... Uh, dictated to the uh, seven churches. He's, he's already talked to us. He's already told us what weaknesses uh, to look out for and, uh, you know, what we need to, to, to correct in each one of the churches. After he finishes this, he looked up and said, Behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice uh, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things uh, which must uh, be hereafter, all right? So it's, it, he's saying that the, uh, the churches will have a, a opportunity to repent, and then this is what's going to happen. And it said, and so he was immediately, uh, was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and up on the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightning and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a seal glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast was like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders f fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So since that was a short chapter, I just wanted to read that whole thing. It's a fascinating scene that's going on uh, in the heavens. And so, uh, you know, we're going to try to look at, at this and we're going to we're going to break it down a little bit, see what we can glean from it. All right. So uh, John is caught up. Uh, he's in the uh, throne room. And uh, so the first thing that happens is that he sees a door open, all right? When he sees his door open, uh, you know, he, you know, he hears the voice of, of the Most High. And so when you, when you hear this, this trumpet-like voice, uh, you can go all the way back into Exodus. And when, when the Most High talks, it, it sounds uh, somewhat like a trumpet when he talks. And he said he was immediately in the spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven. So let's look at that. So when we started talking about a door opening, uh, we got to go back to the tabernacle and we got to understand the tabernacle. And that's why we studied these things before we came into the book of Revelation. So it wouldn't just be cold to you. So when you look at this, uh, you know, of course, we know that the tabernacle on earth was a picture or a figure of what's in heaven. We can see that in Hebrews 9, 24, so for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hand, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So when he talks about uh, the, the holy places, he's saying that the holy places on earth were a picture or a figure of that which is in heaven. 
And so when we look at the tabernacle, there's two holy places. There's the holy place when you go behind that first veil, and then there's the holies of holies. So there's the two holy places. So these, this is the figures of the truth. This is what, uh, what's, uh, you, you know, in the heavens. All right, so keep that in mind. And remember, uh, you, you, had, you, you had to be able to go behind that veil. You had to have access through the veil, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so this is the earthly tabernacle that we've seen uh, through when we studied the tabernacle of Moses. All right, so this is imagery here on the left of, of the uh, heavenly tabernacle, and it's is including the four uh, creatures that we saw and then the holy place. And then of course, the golden laver that's right on the outside of the doorway here in the tabernacle that we studied is, uh, you know, has the water in it. And that's similar to the sea of, of glass that we see uh, here uh, in the heavenly tabernacle. All right, so we also know that um, the, the Garden of Eden uh, was similar, uh, a similar setup to what we see uh, the, the tabernacle. So uh, Garden of Eden is where uh, heaven and earth met uh, uh, in Jerusalem, you know, uh, so the heavenly Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem met. Uh, Adam and Eve had access to all of this. And then once uh, the fall happened, and I think it was around the time of the flood, uh, the Most High put a veil between uh, heaven and earth. And so he put the veil between heaven and earth. Uh, that's uh, you know, it's, it's closed off uh, to us. All right, so when it's closed off, you know, uh, this is pictured by, of course, uh, in the tabernacle, you see the angels on the veils and all that, and, uh, you know, acknowledging that they're the ones that have access uh, into that realm. Isaiah 25, 6 through 7, it tells us that uh, at in the end, when he gets ready to redeem us, he said, in this mountain shall Yahweh of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves of, of, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves well refined, and he will destroy it. In this mountain, talk about in Jerusalem, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. So he's gonna remove that veil. All right, so this is what we're seeing uh, when we see the door opening up for uh, John. Yeah, he, he's opening up that, uh, that veil. So then he says to come up here, you know, he tells John to come up here. So, uh, it, you know, John going up there is a picture of the catching away of the, of the souls that we've been talking about uh, for a while. And so the catching away of the soul does not, uh, does not necessarily mean the uh, resurrection of a body as we discussed before. All right, so in Acts 8, that same word call, called up is, is used and uh, this used um, when Philip uh, had finished ministering to the eunuch and he said the Holy Spirit caught him up, took him from one place to another. So in Acts 8.39, it said when they, they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that eunuch saw him uh, no more and he went on his way rejoicing. Uh, he's used in 2 Corinthians. Uh, he said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Uh, this is Paul talking about himself. He said, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell such a one called up to the third heaven. So he's, he's given an experience when he was, when he was a uh, stone at Lystra and the, you know, he had, he had died and his spirit left his body and he was called up into the third heaven. All right, first Thessalonians 4 and 17, of course, this is uh, the one that's accompanied uh, along with uh, the resurrection. He said, then we which uh, are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that same word uh, called up is used there. So this is, uh, this is uh, the picture that's being shown uh, when John is, is called up and uh, the door is open for him. and He has access uh, to the throne room of the Most High. All right, so then it says, and he that uh, sat uh, he that sat was to look up on like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Uh, so uh, when I looked up the the jasper stone, of course jasper, uh, the way they tried to define it said it could come in any color, uh, but you know uh, it's talking about his appearance. So. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's why most I put two different stones in here, the jasper and the sardine, because sardine, 
uh, as you can see on your right side, this is how it looks. So this, this is what it's saying the appearance of the Messiah looks like. So he has this brownish uh, uh, look to him. All right. Uh, then it said that there was a, uh, there was a bow uh, around about the throne. So why would the bow uh, be around about the throne? Well, the Most High is, is getting ready to start the uh, beginning of sorrow. So it's going to head into the final judgments of uh, the nations. And so just like he told Noah, you know, the promise was he was not going to destroy the earth by, uh, by water uh, anymore. But the rainbow means that, uh, you know, he's getting ready to do it another way. And so that's why the, the rainbow is above him. Uh, and there's a, it's, it's reminding of the covenant. All right, so uh, we see similar scenes with these same type stones uh, in Exodus. All right, so when we were uh, given the law at Mount uh, at the mountain Mount uh, Sinai, um, Moses read uh, the law to the people, and um, after you know they were given the law, uh, the, you know Moses I asked um, Moses and some others. And he said that he asked Moses, he said, come up unto the Lord, thou Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. So he called them up into the mountain. He called all of them, 70 of the elders, plus Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and Moses went up into the mountain. And it said that Moses took the blood and, and sprinkled it on the people, and behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. And then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And so this is what's so amazing. You know, I, I don't know why this is not taught often, but when they went up in the mountain, it was more than just Moses that saw uh, Yeshua. All right, and they saw the God of Israel. And then here, here's the imagery here and saying there were under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and they did eat and drink. So now he's telling us that not only did they sin, but he ate and drank with them. Okay, so this is pointing to uh, in Revelations, uh, where he talks about eating and, and drinking with us in the kingdom. All right. Uh, so everything has a has a, what happened at that particular point, and then what's going to happen again, all right? And the Lord said to Moses, "Come up, come up to me in the mountain and be there, and I will give thee the table of stones and law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them." So Moses went up a little bit higher uh, than everybody else, uh, him and Joshua, but he went a little bit higher than Joshua. All right, so that's important. So that imagery is there uh, even in the book of Exodus, okay, with those stones. Uh, we see the imagery again in Ezekiel uh, 1, 26 to 28. And it said, And above the firmament that was over his head was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man uh, above upon it. And I saw as the color of uh, amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins upward and from the appearance of his uh, loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. And then you see this bow again. It says as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. It was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So we see those similar scenes as we're seeing in the book of Revelation, Exodus, and in Ezekiel. All right, and then it said, and out of the thrones proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of Yah. And so we, we've looked at the seven spirits of Yah before. It, it's one, but it's, it's, it's seven attributes, all right? And so we, we can look at Isaiah 11, one through two. And he said, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of, of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's one in the spirit of wisdom. There's two in the spirit of understanding, uh, three in the spirit of counsel, four and might, five, knowledge, six, and the fear of the Lord, seven. So this is the, the seven spirits. All right, then it said, 
that and round about the throne were four and 24 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. All right, so who's all sitting on the throne? Uh, the assumption is that it's 12 New Testament and 12 Old Testament. I can't prove that, but I know that at least 12 of the seats uh, are uh, the uh, of the 12 apostles. And the reason I know that is because in Matthew 19, 28, it said, and Yeshua said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's 12 of the seats uh, right there. All right, and then it said, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And so, like we said before, that sea of glass of crystal, the picture of it is the golden laver here. And then, of course, we see a sea of glass uh, in the imagery of the heavenly uh, tabernacle. All right, then we see the four beasts. It said, and the first was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And so they're, they're worshiping him, they're saying, Holy, 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 they're not resting, and they're, and they're, they're looking at what he did, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. So they're looking, you to think about it, he, they're looking at the complete work of the Messiah, all right? It's almost like they're witnesses uh, to the full work and they're worshiping him for his full work. And because it's not completely done yet, they can't rest. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just, they can't rest and they're, they're just praising him about that uh, day and night. So we see the imagery of that in Ezekiel 10, 10 through 14, uh, we see the same thing. So if you wanna go read that, uh, you can read that. So what does the four beasts uh, stand for? Anytime you see the number four, uh, you know, number four, you know, represents the earthly realm. Uh, you know, you got the four gospels, the four corners of the earth, four winds of the earth. Uh, so it always points to the earthly realm. So, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, numbers before and what, what a lot of them mean. So when you see four, that's a big clue. So when you see that four, then you can start looking in other areas and see how the numbers correspond to uh, doctrine, all right? So, um, you know, since we just did Passover yesterday, um, you know, uh, and we talked about the four cups uh, that we have on, on Passover. And this was the promises that Yahweh made to, to Israel. And, and we got four cups corresponding to four of the promises, but not, not the fifth one, but, but the fourth one we do. It said, he said, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and great judgment. I will take you to, be, to me for a people and I will be your God. That's the fifth one. But the ones that correspond with the four cups seem to correspond also with the bull, the lion, the man, and the eagle, because they're witnesses of what was and that is and, and that is to come. So the complete work. Well, let's look at that and see if it makes sense. All right. So when he says he's going to remove the, the, uh, the burden of sin, well, he's the calf or the bull. The bull is always used as the sin offering. You can see that in Leviticus 4 and 8. So as our sin offering, uh, those, those four faces are, are pointing to the Messiah. Uh, the, uh, the bull represents him removing the burden of sin from us with the sin offering, all right? And then you might say, okay, well, he said he's gonna rescue, uh, rescue us out of our bondage, right? And so when we look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy and Hebrew 11, uh, 33, in First Peter, he's talking about. In First Peter, he's talking about, uh, you know, how Satan is going about as a roaring lion seeking who he might destroy. In Second Timothy, he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, pulling us from the mouths of the of the lion. And the same thing in Hebrews eleven 
uh, the, the bondage or, or the cap captivity of the lion. And so uh, this particular lion here is, uh, you know, that's being shown in heaven uh, on one of the faces of the cherubim is representative of him coming and rescuing us out of the mouth of the, of the lion. All right, then, uh, you know, it shows a man and it says he's gonna rescue us or redeem us. He's gonna buy us back with a stretched out arm. And we know that this stretched out arm represents him being uh, on the cross and his arm stretched out wide. And he came down as a man to redeem us. And so that's that third one. And then he said uh, he was gonna take us and he's gonna take us to him for a people. He was gonna bring us to himself. And so this eagle, uh, that, that's what he's talking about. Just like in Exodus 19 and four, he said, when he brought us out the first time, he said, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wing and brought you unto myself. So that language, him bringing us to him. So he's going to use eagle's wing to bring us to himself. And so this is why he said, I would take you uh, to me uh, for a people. And we see it again in Isaiah 40, 33, because he's prophesying that he's going to do that same thing again. And he said, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings with eagles, as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So we see those four uh, faces of the cherubim. Uh, we see that they point to uh, the work of the Messiah. We see that they're not resting because he, they're waiting on the, on the complete work of the Messiah, which was, which is, and what is to come to be uh, completed. And we're not there yet. Now, since it's four, again, uh, there's also another nugget that you can look at because we got the four, what we call the four gospels, right? And we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each one of those gospels point to uh, a different aspect of our Messiah. Each one of the writers are trying to prove a point uh, and they're, they're trying to prove a, a, a emphasize a different point about the Messiah. So when you, when you look at Matthew, it said, uh, you know, Matthew is, is, is trying to prove Yeshua as the sovereign King, uh, th that he was prophesied throughout the whole old Testament. And he emphasizes the fact that Yeshua is the messianic savior and has come to earth to lead his kingdom, you know, and, and he talks about his birthright and all those type of things. Mark, uh, he depicts Yeshua as the servant of all. He, he talks about him a lot being the son of man, the one sent by God to serve his people, uh, to submit himself to the father's will, even to death. So in this book, we find our king in the form of a servant willing to suffer for the purposes of, 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 of God. So which animal would that represent? Of course, that would, that would represent the, the bull or the calf. Matthew would uh, uh, represent um, probably uh, the lion, all right? And then um, in Luke, it says Yeshua is seen as a savior for all mankind. We find his hum hum humanness in instances as the nativity, as well as references to uh, uh, Jesus' genealogy being traced back to Adam. So when we're looking, so he, since he's he's showing to be the savior of all mankind, uh, then you know he's number three representing uh, the man. All right, and then John uh, presents us with Yeshua as the great I am the living uh, perfectly divine son of God. He is the word of God, the creator who breathed life into us, who still works among us through the Holy Spirit. And that would be number four, the eagle. All right, so you can see all of these things working together uh, to show us uh, the, the plan of our Messiah. And so uh, this is the throne room uh, that's, that's happening, uh, you know, uh, before John. So he's able to see this great throne room. He's able to see all these things that's happening. And uh, so it's going to set us up for the next scene that we're going to get into uh, more next week. Uh, and, you know, it's going to set us up for that. So that we'll, since we've looked at all of these elements, then we can dig down even a little bit deeper about what's really happening right now uh, in that throne room. And so uh, that's kind of it on, on the... Uh, on what I want to show today, uh, since I threw out so much information yesterday, I didn't want to give out too much today, along with yesterday, that's too much to absorb.
but that's quite a bit of information, I think, too. And then uh, when we get into Revelation 5 next week, we'll really dig into that as well. All right, so with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for, uh, for questions, comments. Uh, y'all quiet, y'all. I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, Go ahead. In Julie. Second Corinthians chapter three, starting at twelve, it talks about um, we with unveiled face. First, it says Moses' face was veiled because the glory was on him, and the people couldn't. Mm -hmm. But then later, it talks about us who are reborn. Our uh, our faces are uncovered, and we. Um, we reflect his glory. Is, is that the same as the veil? All right, Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter three, starting at verse twelve. Okay. All right. So ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, and such trust we have through Christ to Godward. Not that we are suffi sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of Yah who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of, of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glory, glorious. All right. Seeing that then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his faith that the children of Israel could not step fatly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is up on their heart. All right, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. All right. Behold, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. All right, that's, that's a lot of good stuff right there. All right, so it starts off, and he's talking about uh, Moses. He, Moses came out down out of the mountain, all right, and he was he was he was glowing when he came out of the mountain, and it freaked the people out, you know, and it 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 freaked them out so bad he had, he started to wear a veil over his face, so you know. Uh, so that it, they wouldn't be freaked out by the glory that was coming off of him. Uh, but if I'm uh, reading this correctly, the, at, you know, the longer that he was out of the mountain, the more that that glory dissipated and the less glory he was showing, but he kept the veil on because he had just put the imagery up as if he had something that he didn't. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? So that glory, what he was saying, you know, it was by the law uh, was not, you know, the law was condemned us because because the law itself, we couldn't keep it. So, and he said, even if, if it condemning us was glorious, imagine what the, you know, what happens when Yeshua did what he did and now we can receive this righteousness uh, through grace, how much more glorious it, it will be. 
So he's 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 alluding to the fact that okay, we need to understand the spirit of the law and follow the spirit of the law so that we can take the pretentious veils off of ourselves. All right. And when we take the pretentious veil off of ourselves, we can keep our our eyes fixed on the Messiah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's awesome what he's saying. And so he said, as we keep our eyes fixed on the Messiah, we are changed into looking like the Messiah. I mean, this this is probably he said, he said, but we all with open faith, without the veil on. He said, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. And then he talks about that we can go from one level of glory to the next level of glory. He said, the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So if we keep our minds fixed on him, instead of talking about the letter of the law, and understand the spirit of the law. I mean, that's that's what he's saying up there. Then we can be changed into the image of the son. But if we get caught up in looking at the letter of the law, which condemned us to begin with, he's, you know, he said, we put that veil back on and it keeps us from being able to go from one glory with the Messiah to the next, next glory. That makes sense? Yes, that's what I learned from Passover yesterday. That's what I felt that you were showing through the lesson from yesterday. Yeah, and that's why, uh, you know, I, you know, I try to emphasize that there's a, there's the letter of the law and then there's the spirit of the law. There's the letter of the law that, that's got the rule, but there's a reason behind the rule. And the Most High is trying to get to the reason behind the rule. What is, that, what is he trying to show us? What's, what is the spirit speaking? So that's why when Yeshua showed up, he would say, you say this, but I say, you know, and they were going by the letter of the law, but he said, that's not what it meant. And that's when we were talking about the Sabbath yesterday. He said, you know, we talked about, he said, I didn't make the Sabbath. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't make you for the, for the Sabbath, you know. You know, I made the Sabbath for you, you know. And so he said, that's what I meant by it. But even saying that, people ain't gonna listen. They're gonna keep the veil on, you know, because uh, they're gonna argue about what that means. So, but he's saying as long as we do, we're gonna keep. We're gonna keep. Uh, we're not gonna be able to go from that one level of glory to the next level of glory. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it goes right along with what we talked about yesterday. You know, understanding the work that he did. And giving him all the honor and the glory for what he did. Yeah. All right, that's good. Anybody else? When you talk about going from glory to glory, you're talking about looking more and more like him. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because what what he's saying is uh the the more we look at him, the more flesh we get rid of. And the more flesh, our reward is based upon how much flesh we get rid of. And how much flesh we get rid of in this life. And the reward, if the reward is greater, then he's saying our body would be more glorious in the resurrection. So, uh, you know, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there's different, there are different uh, levels of glory. You know. So, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question about the beast. So those are actual beasts. They're not angels. They're, 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 not... they're cherubim. Uh, it's, uh, okay, they're they use okay. a different Greek word uh, for that beast than they do the beast when we get to uh, Revelation 13 and we're talking about the Antichrist and all that and they use the word beast. It is a different word in uh, Greek. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so they're actually cherubim, you know. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kendall. Hey, Kendall. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey. Now, I was just going to ask real quickly. So the 70 elders, they actually saw God? Yeah, they saw Yeshua when they went up in the mountain. Yeah. Yeshua. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because no man's seen the father. So right. yeah. that's why that's what I have to yeah. clear it up. Okay. Yeah. So anytime we were we were in the Old Testament, we see that uh, we see that understand that it's, it's Yeshua that you know that's being seen. You know whether it's Jacob wrestling with uh, with the angel, and he said, "I've seen the face of of of, of Yah, whatever." Uh, that was Yeshua. Yeah. So we and we see him when 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 uh, Abraham sit down with the with with who he called Yah, and and the two men were with him, and they sit down and they ate together. The one that he called, uh, you know, Yah, was Yeshua. Yeah, so it's you see it all throughout our scripture. Yeah, Hank. Judy just asked the perfect setup question. Thank you, because <laughs> um, it, it talks about in, in um, Exodus that they the seventy came up, and then in Luke it talks about G Yeshua sending the seventy out. out. Mm -hmm. so, so what's that connection, and what's the what's the significance of the number seventy? Yeah, every time you see the seventy. The 70 ends up representing the nations, you know. Now, why would he use Israel 70 to talk about the nation? Because Israel was supposed to be the light of the world. Mm -hmm. All right. So we were, we were, we were the governing, we, we, we were to be the governing body, right, of the, of the rest of the nations, you know. And, uh, you know, when we, when we became the light of the world, which was theoretically what we were supposed to do, we were going to be sitting in those 70 uh, places. Uh, that didn't happen. We, of course, we, we, we fell off. So when you see those 70 in the Old Testament, when you see them in the New Testament, they're representing that, um, that uh, the governing authority that was supposed to rule over the nations. But when we got to Yeshua, we fell off. The 70 fell off. Right. <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't, we, those who were supposed to be first are going to end up being last. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to get those 70 seats back because we are, but we're going to end up going last, if that makes sense. All right. All right. That, that make. Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right. Uh, Adam. Is that me? Oh, hi. Um, I have a question about the significance of or interpretation of the eyes. It mentions mm -hmm. in Revelations 4, 6 that um, the four living creatures were covered in eyes from front to back. Is there mm -hmm. a significance to why there's, they're covered in eyes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's significant in the fact that they, they're seeing everything. They're covered in eyes. There's no, there's no direction where you could approach the throne that, that, what's going on is not being seen. So they're saying, uh, we're seeing everything which was, we're seeing everything which is, and everything that's coming. Okay. You know, it's like they're guarding the, it's almost too like they're guarding the throne so they can see in every direction. They can see everything that's, that's coming. That's, that, that may be a basic answer, but that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the basics of, of what, why they had all the eyes. Okay, thank you. Are you welcome. <laughs> all right, Marcus. Um, Mr. Kendall, I didn't quite quite catch when you were uh, talking about the four beasts. Do you mind um, were, uh, giving me a quick explanation of each one? Okay, let me pull that back up. All right. So you remember yesterday we talked about how the Messiah uh, was going to bring us out. Then we talked about in our tradition, uh, there were four cups uh, that we would drink during Passover, commemorating the promises that uh, our God made to us on how he was going to deliver us. All right. So uh, it, it, when you see those, when you see the number four, it's always talking, pointing to the work that the Messiah is going to do on earth, or it's, going to, it's pointing to earthly things, right? So he's got those four, uh, he's got those creatures in each one of those, or, or cherubims in heaven, and each one of them has a different, they have four different faces, right? And they have a face, one is, uh, one of the faces on there is the face of a bull, one is the face of a lion, one is the face of a man, one is the face of an eagle. Since it's four of them is representing 
the work that he's going to do on earth, right? Um, so we know that the bull, uh, when you look it up, it's, it's, uh, it's the one that you had to have before you can do anything else. You had to have the sin offering, right? And the sin offering, uh, a bull had to be uh, slain. Uh, you see that in Leviticus 4 and 8. So the bull represented the work that our Messiah was going to do on earth as being the one who takes away the sins of the world. Right? So that's what the bull is representing. Okay. All right. So then the, the face of the lion is representing the work that he's going to do to rescue us out of our bondage. And so we'll go and look at these scriptures here in a minute. Second Timothy 4, 17, Hebrews 11, 33. Uh, so uh, those scriptures are, are saying that we're like in the mouth of a lion, you know, because uh, he's using the terminology, uh, the lion, you know, because the, our enemy goes about as a roaring lion seeking who he might destroy. And even though, uh, you know, Yeshua has paid the price for our sins, some of us are still in bondage, uh, you know, in a way, because we're, we haven't broke, uh, broke away from our enemy and he has us in his mouth he has us in his mouth with wrong doctrine he has us in his mouth uh, uh, you know with with bad teaching he has we, we're not completely out of bondage even though we have uh you know been supposedly set free you know by the price or the sin offering we're still caught up right so we'll look at those scriptures that i got there uh, then that's the face of the man because he's saying that he, you know, he will redeem us with an outstretched arm. So he came down in the form of a man. And while he was on the cross, of course, his arms were stretched out wide in order to redeem us, to buy us back, to pay the price. Uh, so we see that. And then we see the, uh, the eagle because he said, now, after I've done all that, uh, I'm going to bring you to me. All right, and so when we get to the eagle scriptures where he's talking about bringing us to him, he gives us like Exodus 19 and four, where he's talking about him bringing us to himself in the wilderness after we left uh, Egypt, you know, when we went to meet him at the mountain. And so uh, he's saying, I, I bear you on eagle's wings. So he's using this imagery of, of bringing us to him, you know, on eagle's wing. So he did it one time. So now he's promising to do similar again in Isaiah 40, uh, you know, 31. He, and he's saying that the same thing is going to happen again when he gets ready to bring us back out again. He's going to do it again. He's going to mount us on eagle's wings again. All right. So there's something supernatural that's going to happen then with him bearing us up on eagle's wings. Uh, there's one text out there that, uh, that really goes into a little detail about that. And we'll get to that as we approach maybe Re revelation 13 14 somewhere in there um and then i also said because it's the number four uh, matthew mark luke and john are pointing to those same four uh characters the bull the lion the man and the eagle and so i put the, the characteristics that each one of the gospels uh, were trying to point to about the messiah because each one of them emphasizing something different about the messiah all right, that makes sense? Yes, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just keep meditating on that and it'll it'll absorb. Yeah, because I understand um I definitely understand um you know him coming down and being an outstretched arm as he did on the cross. <clears throat> um I didn't know that the four beasts were four cherub cherubims. Me personally, I would think it was actually four actual beasts up there, <clears throat> potentially roaming around instead of them actually being cherubim. Yeah, and so when you get to go to Ezekiel, Eze Ezekiel clarifies that. Um, you see the same creatures. Uh, like, so when you go down to uh, verse 14, and it said, everyone had four faces. Those are four faces we were talking about. He said, the first face was the face of a cherub, and the uh, second face of a man, and the third face of a lion, and the fourth face of an eagle. Now, he uses the word cherub on this one. Uh, but it's understood that uh, the, um, the beasts were cherubims. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like kind of like angels. So, all right. 
All right, uh, Patrice. Um, okay, I have a question about at what point did they understand that Yah was sending his son? Because like um, you mentioned about how they felt that they had wrestled with God, how they felt they saw God when it was really Yeshua that, that they saw. At what point when he was telling um, Enoch about him coming, even in the book of Adam and Eve, he talks about Christ being sent. Did they ever understand what he was talking about, like in the Old Testament? Yeah, uh, they uh, many of them did. Most of the patriarchs and the ones that were more faithful, they understood it, and they passed it down from one generation to the next generation. Adam was waiting on that promise because you remember they were given the promise about her seed will uh, bruise the head of of, of Satan's seed, and mm -hmm. so they knew that there was a, a Messiah coming. Uh, all of the pages I knew that there was a Messiah coming. As we went down through history, uh, you know that was that was uh, our thought process as a people. We didn't uh, we didn't always understand it the way Abraham or David understood it, because David was writing the Psalms about going to hell and not allowing my, you know, uh, my God to you know or to see destruction, you know, or whatever. While he was in hell, so there was some understanding. Um. And we had to understand as a people that there was a, a Messiah coming, but there was argument just like it is now about what that was going to look like, right? Okay. And so uh, by the time it got to the coming of Christ, the argument uh, was more, even the disciples believed when Yeshua came, they believed he was the Messiah, but the prophets, you know, he was supposed to come back and just destroy the kingdom because that's what the prophecy said, right? They were supposed to destroy all these people, our enemies, eat them, all that. They had read all that. So they were waiting on him to come in, get the army together, and they were going to go in and just, just, you know, destroy everybody, and they were going to rule on earth. So that was the imagery that they had. They didn't understand that he had to come twice, you know, whatever. Okay. All right, so... uh so they didn't have that insight so by the time we got to Yeshua. Okay. And, and that's why, you know, he used that as an opportunity, you know, to, he said, I, I, I picked all 12 of you, one of you is the devil, you know, that he used that opportunity to get his enemy in there. And then when you do more research, it seems that Judas was actually an Edomite. Mm -hmm. And so he used the Edomite who wanted power and money uh, you know, and when he realized that Yeshua was talking about I'm going to die, he's like, man, I'm not going to, you know, he was a thief, right? Mm -hmm. So his idea was, okay, if this is the true Messiah, you know, and he's going to rule over this whole kingdom, I'm going to be treasurer over the whole kingdom. So if I'm making money now, with the with the money we're making now, and I'm the treasurer, and I, imagine what's going to happen if I'm the treasurer over the whole kingdom. Now, you should tell me I got to die. So you said, man, this brother, I don't walk with this brother all the time. He talking about he's going to die. I got to get something out of this deal. You know what I'm saying? So he, he sold him. He sold him out. He said, I'm going to get something out of it. And he got that, he, he got that money, you know. So uh, there was, there was a, not a clear understanding of the timing of when things were going to happen. They didn't understand that he had to die because everybody was so caught up in the letter of the law. They thought they were righteous because of what, you know, them following the law. And so they just did not understand uh, the element of grace that he was bringing to the scene. Now the Essenes did, they understood it, but the rest of them had a problem. All right, uh, Al. Oh, the shoulders. How you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing all right. You? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so I've been on this uh, journey for a while, and I gotta admit that I uh, I still sometimes get a little bit confused between uh, how you make the distinction between Yeshua and Yah, and um, especially when, for instance, you say, okay, uh, the figure that they saw in Ezekiel that was Yeshua. How do you make that? determination can you help clarify that for me yeah for me it's pretty simple um because of the words of, of yeshua 
you know, because I, I, I was like that years ago. I was saying, well, why do people say this and why do people say that? But, you know, when he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Most High, right? And so Yeshua comes along and he says, no man has seen the Father but me. Okay, so that sealed the deal for me. When he said that no man, not, not one, no man but me, I'm the only one that's seen him, then that clarified everything for me because I, I believe it. He said it. And so if he said no man, I mean, that means, there, you know, Moses, the Adam, it, no man seen the father but me, you know? And so I know when now, when I, I look in the, in the old Testament and I see uh, people uh, seeing and they call them, um, they call them Yahweh, you know, I know that's Yeshua. It's got to be because he said, because of what he said and it, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So, um, yeah, so that's why that's a, it's a clear line for me. All right. That makes sense to everybody that that's, that's a clearly drawn line that you sure that you sure had about who had seen the, the father. It, it does brother shoulders, but there was also that other uh, scripture that you gave in, um, Exodus when, uh, um, God had passed over and um, uh, he saw, Moses saw the backside of God, but Yeshua was there and the Holy Spirit. I mean, you kind of gave the all three of them in that instance as well. So even though he saw his backside, he could, he didn't see him. He just saw his backside. Right, right. He, he saw the, the, the remnant, of the glory of, of what was left, yeah. So, Elder Shoulders, are you saying there's no distinction, or is there a distinction between, you know, the Father and Son? I guess that that's the last question on this. And it, it clarified this, what you mean by distinction. By distinction, okay. Because, all right, I'll give you some context for for where this question is coming from. So, I was having a conversation with somebody about um, using the images and creating these images around the Most High and images around Yeshua, et cetera, et cetera. And I was saying that the Most High says, don't create images and likenesses. Um, and then it went towards, well, likenesses of him or just likenesses of everyone. And so as we started to go down that path, the discussion came up, well, well Jesus was a man, right? He, he was 100% man. Okay, yes, he was, because he had to be. Um, and then, but is Jesus God? And then I understand, you know, that in the beginning was the word and he was the word, but when he became flesh, did he become a separate entity? It's just something that's confusing for me. I mean, no, he did not. He, he, he was, he was still, okay, let me, let me pull this scripture up. He was still, um, uh, yeah, in the flesh, right? But what he, sure. what he did, he submitted himself while he was in the flesh and so he allowed himself to be stripped and it was like he he couldn't use his he couldn't use his yardness i guess if you want to say to get himself out of any trouble he had to walk like we walk by faith so his only option then even though he was god and he thought it thought it not robbery to be equal with yah it said that he humbled himself to, to the point where at any point while he was here, he could have abandoned the plan and said, I don't want to do this. He had the authority to do it. He just chose not to do it because he, he was still, yeah. I hope, I hope that makes sense. But he humbled himself uh, to his father and, and he only listened to what he was being told, even if it didn't make any sense while he was in this hum human form. All right, so let's, uh, let's pull up a scripture. Okay, and while you're doing that, so for instance, and, I, and I'll show you where some of my confusion comes in over time. Mm -hmm. It's like right when you were telling me that, you were like, from his father, and we know he prayed to his father and always pointed us towards the father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it's like, oh, it's kind of tricky in my mind to try to navigate that. Yeah. Um, all right, so... 
Let me see. How can we explain it? You know, when we were talking about the um, the threefold nature of 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 Yah. All right, but let's look at this, and then we'll talk about the threefold nature. All right, so he said, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. All right, so this, this is what we're getting to. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also uh, in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. All right, so when he was in heaven and he was there and they said, and, and, and it said, Yah looked at him, looked at Yah, or Yah, he looked at Adonai, they changed the word, and said, sit here at my right hand, just before he came down, until I make your enemies your footstool. So they were there together. I mean, that's the imagery that he's trying to give us. They were in heaven together, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. And he said, while he was there in the heavens, he said, he thought it not robbery to be equal. With him. He said, if I'm there, if I was to say that we're equal, I'm not taking anything away from the Father. That's how equal that he thought they were. All right. But it said he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made into the likeness of men and been, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So what he's saying is, while I was with him, there, I knew I was equal with him. And I wasn't taking anything away from him, saying I'm equal. But then I found myself, and I took up on the form of a man, and I found myself in the form of and being fashioned as a man. So while, I was, while I'm in this flesh, now I've taken on something that is different from what we've ever been you get so now i'm in the form of this flesh and and and, and this flesh is pulling at me all the time Th this flesh that is so different from what i'm used to is telling me to do things that my previous you know in my in my original nature i wouldn't even think about doing you know, I can now be influenced by the same enemy that Adam was influenced by. How can I say, how can I judge Adam and say, how can you fall if I've never been in the position that Adam was in? It's easy for me to sit in my own nature and judge somebody and say, you know what, uh, you know, I can't believe you did that. But to put myself in the same position as Adam with the same desires, with the same things pulling at him, with the same issues, the same same stuff coming at him. Can I hold up? Can the enemy trick me too? See, this is the test that the Messiah had to go through. God himself had to go. If he had not went through that, the Satan could have challenged him. And Satan could have said, listen, you down here, you talking about you the judge, you the great judge, but you don't know what it's like to be them. You don't know what it's like to be hungry. You don't know what it's like to be tempted. You don't know none of these things, and yet you sit there as the judge. But he knew this, that this was a gap in the plan. And so he said, no, I'm going to go down in the form of man. I'm going to have my own nature in me but I'm also going to be in the nature of man as well. And there's going to be conflict. Which one is going to win? And if I fall, because he said before I came, he said, because I couldn't find anything greater to swear by. He said, I looked at my own throne and I said, I'm going to swear on myself. So if I mess up, 
I'm stepping down from this thing. I'm no longer the most high. Yeah, y'all gotta see what he put on wow. online, what he put online for us, man. That's it's it's awesome. So he put himself in a position to fall, to be influenced the same way that we're influenced. And he said, which one of the natures are gonna win? Is it gonna be my nature? which I'm going to put inside this flesh, or is it going to be the nature of this flesh that's going to be pulling at me all the time? Can I get through this thing without seeing? Wow. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. All the chips are in. Yeah, all the yeah. chips are in, dude. And so he was still who he was because you remember we talked about the trial and nature of the Most High, how he was all one. But he understood that to try to get us to understand who he is, he had to pull himself apart. And he des hmm. he described that through Adam. He said, I'm going to make man in my own image. And he made him all one, just like he was, right? But then he pulled something out of him, set it over here. And then you had the Holy Spirit that was in the middle. So you had the same imagery. So here he is describing to us what he did to himself. Because when we look at our own nature, there's conflict even in our own nature, right? Uh, the way I think, I always don't do what I think. And I always don't say what I do. And then there's conflict. But what he's saying is that what I think, I'm sitting on the throne as the father, what I think as the father and what I say through my son and what I do with the power of my spirit, all agree. There's no variance in me, right? So even if I take my word, which I pull out of myself and put it in flesh, I'm betting that my word will hold up over this flesh, but it was still him. So, you know, and as long as he humbled himself to himself, because while he was in his flesh, he understood there's going to be conflict. I'm going to get confused sometimes. I'm not going to understand sometimes. I'm going to be looking at one, one thing one way and it's really something else going on. So I'm strictly going to listen to what my father, I'm going to trust what he said, regardless of how it looks, regardless of how it looks. So here he is, he comes up out of the water, he's baptized, the, the heavens open up, dove come down, and he says, and he says, uh, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, boy, you are you all right. And then it said that the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Okay, wait a minute, I just confessed that I was a son. I, I heard the voice from heaven say, I have a son. Now I'm out here, can't eat for 40 days, for a night. Not by my own choice, but because this is what my father told me to do. Now, how am I, what, what, what do I do out here while I'm out here? I gotta trust my father. So then the enemy comes to him uh, in a situation where he's, he's being tested. He don't know why he's out there. The enemy comes to him and he gives them those three challenges. And he tests him the same way he tested Adam in the garden with the pride of uh, 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 the, the lust of the eyes, lust of the face, and the pride of life. And he passed it. All right. And so he was always dealing with the challenges, but he would always go listen to what his father said before he made the move because he had to walk by faith and not by sight. So yeah, he had to humble himself. That's why he said he had to humble himself to himself and not trust his flesh. He had to trust everything that his father told him, even unto the death of the cross. My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? But even if you have, I'm still going to trust you. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's wow. an awesome thing, you know. So what he did was, was so awesome. And, and trying to understand the gravity of it, uh, it's it's amazing. And I understand the, the confusion, but it was all him. He's one God. But he pulled himself out so that we could see what he's thought, what he would say, and what he would do. And they all agree in one. I hope that makes sense, but he, he's awesome. Kendall, I, when you... um. A few Sundays Sundays ago, when you explained what you just went over again, the uh, triune triune nature of God um, and um, getting away from this Trinity thing, 
that painted such a vivid picture because I had always wondered the same question that uh, uh, my brother there just asked, uh, wondered about that. But when you explained that trionisha of, of Yah, we, I think we were talking about uh, uh, Adam and we're, and we're talking about um, uh, how did God come, uh, uh, how did uh, the sun come about? How did the spirit come about? And you explained that trial nature just like you just went over again. That painted such a vivid picture. I no longer have a question about what you just went over and refreshed us on because I had wondered the, the same thing about, you know, how is he the son? How does he actually be the son and man and everything? But you had explained that how God pulled the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, out. Uh, for the woman, she, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, and the the son, uh, you know, he, and um, uh, that just, uh, I, I, I no longer have, I wondered about that all my life. How did the, the son come about? Because the scripture says that God is spirit. Okay, he is spirit. Uh, and I had always wondered about that. How did the son get here? And how did the, what the Holy Spirit come from? Because he was with uh, uh, Yah. And his creation in Genesis, he said he was right there, right there at his side and everything. So I just didn't know how, how that whole thing came about. And I was confused by the Trinity that the, that the Christian church teaches. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I, 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 am, I am so clear on that now, uh, uh, the triune nature of God. And I thank you again uh, for going over again. But I remembered it. You know, when, mm, that's when, awesome, yeah. But yeah. I remembered that. And, and because uh, I, I have no questions about that, I understand. What, what God did uh, in, the, in that triune nature. And so when we talk about then the, the, the image of God, so he said, don't make any graven images of me. Why? Why can't we? What he was saying, well, this is what he was saying. I made an image of me. <laughs> and it was Adam. Yeah, 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 I got to see it. And Adam and then, then the, the bride. And that's, that, that's my image when I, all one that's my image that's 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 me so now yeshua comes up in that same image he's he's you know he's he's got it all all there you know uh the body the the the, the spirit uh you know so he's he's all he's got it all there so that's why he could say if you've seen me you've seen the father yeah i guess so there's, there's no reason for the image okay so now when we're reborn Again, we start transforming into the image. Yeah, yeah, I gotta see. Because we're we're conquering this flesh, and the more flesh we put down, the more we're in his image, right? So that's why it's it's important for when when we walk out into the world and people hate us for our image, they don't realize that they're beginning to hate the very God that we represent because now we are being made into his image. So he doesn't need anybody to make one. He made the image himself. And so he's going to judge the world on how they treat his image <laughs> on, on earth. Yeah, yeah. How can you say you love me who you have not seen? But my image, <laughs> yeah, yeah, get, my image is there and you hate my image. Man, I'm telling you, it's Bob's. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, let me see. who's uh, Victoria? Yeah. May I say something? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add on as you were saying that I just the great love that um, God has for us, and it was a demonstration. And there's no greater love than what He demonstrated. He demonstrated from the beginning to the end. And I believe that when the apostles were saying, well, we want you to go to war, um, Jesus, we want you to go to war. He was saying, well, how can I go to war with your enemies until I come and judge you? Because you have to turn back into what you were before in the Garden of Eden, if I can understand that. So that once again, we can be made in his image. So as you were saying, I was just saying, wow, how awesome. And, and, and Satan couldn't love. He wanted to be God, but he, could, he can't love like the most high. So for him to turn himself into to be Christ and to be one, that was just awesome. It's, to it's just awesome. Yeah. To humble himself. Mm -hmm. It was just so awesome. Thank you.
Yeah, and so he's telling us, okay, so I know you're a king, and I know you're a priest, and I know I got all these promises up on you, but while you're in this flesh, you need to do like I did, and you need to humble yourself. Yeah, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who thought it not robber to be equal with God, why he was with him, but, but when he found himself in the form of this sinful flesh, he humbled himself. Why can't we humble ourselves? Why we find ourselves in this sinful flesh? And the same way that we he overcame is how we overcome by listening to every word that our father is telling us, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. Hey, Kendall, I need you to forgive your enemies and love your enemies. Well, that don't make sense, Lord. I'm not going to do it. Well, see, now I don't trust what he's telling me to do. I'm looking at it from my own eyes and my own hurt and my own pain. But that's not what Yeshua did. He didn't look at it from his own pain, his own hurt. He looked at it from the perspective of his father. Can we do that? Can we take that nature on ourselves and simply trust what he tell us to do and say to ourselves, if I do it the way he asked me to do it, even though it doesn't make sense to me, even though I'm in the wilderness, even though I don't understand, if I do it the way he asked me to do it, do I trust that it's going to come out the way he's telling me that it's going to come out? And that's our challenge every day. Walk by faith, not by what we see. All right. All right, Miss. Uh, let me see. Hank, you next. And then uh, Miss Pitts. This this is really really good stuff. Could, would you mind pulling up um, First Corinthians chapter twelve? Because um, <clears throat> I've wrestled with this same thing uh, that Al and you have wrestled with, and uh, others too. And and I, and um, in, in, in Psalms eighteen, I think it is. Uh, David prays, "Keep me from presumptuous sin." And you, you shared a verse earlier about Jesus saying, only I have seen Yah, only me. And so it, the way that I understand, you know, why Yah says, don't um, create any images of me is because he's a spirit and he's only been seen by Yeshua. And so any effort that we take or we make to create what we think is an image of him that is presumption. It is, it is me thinking that I know something that I don't know. It is me thinking that I know something above and beyond what has already been made known. Because to your point, uh, you know, you, Yah made us in his image. So he's already presented what he wants us <laughs> to, to, to see of him and to, and to, to know of him. And so when, and when I when I start trying to wrestle with that's that's one point. The other point is um, the wrestling with the triune nature of um, of God. I, I I think I understand that everything that in, in every way God presents Himself and and, and, the, and He exists. He exists for a purpose. He, he He just doesn't exist for no reason. Just to say He exists, He exists for a person. And I I read the scripture in First Corinthians chapter twelve at verse four that really, really uh, helped me um, many years ago. And now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Mm -hmm. And now, and there are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And so what I, what I think I understand today is each person of, of, of the, the Godhead, uh, is each personality, they have a different function. They have a different purpose. They have a, a different role. And, and could, could you imagine Yeshua coming down on this earth, uh, trying to create the effects of God? without leaning on the, 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 the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit often he's trying to do all that stuff in his own flesh. I know, I know how much I mess up stuff when I, um, when I operate in my flesh and it helps me to understand why you know, he was compelled uh, to go um, fast for 40 days. Mm -hmm. Because if, if he 
down there opting in in, in his flesh and not leveraging and understanding, you know, the purposes of the spirit and the purposes of Yah, this thing would have been screwed up like nobody, like nobody's business. But I, I do think I understand that in the the, three, the person head of, uh, the, the, of, of the Godhead, these personalities, these persons of God, they have different functions and different roles. And so every time you say, I see this in the Old Testament, um, you know, and this is this is Yeshua, I, I go back and say, okay, is that person offering some type of ministry? Then confirm it is, that is Yeshua in the Old Testament because that's his purpose. Yeah, and so, yeah, so when we look at it and he says, um, he made of himself no reputation. Yep. All right, so now we're, we're getting into another category. He hid himself. <laughs> you know, he, he hid himself so that the enemy wouldn't know the plan. See, this is what's so awesome about the, 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 the law and all that type of stuff. Had, had the enemy known that the Passover lamb was pointing to the Messiah, and that the work that they were doing with the Passover lamb was really him, he never would have crucified the Most High. If, if the enemy had known that the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night was actually the Messiah, you know, uh, you know, he, 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 he would have diverted his plan in a whole uh, different way. If he had known that he was the water that was coming out of the rock, he may have diverted his plan. If he had known that he was the turtle dove, if he had known that he was the bullock and the scapegoat, if he had known that he was all those things, then maybe he would have he would have done something a little bit different. Had he known that he was the total worm, had he known that he, you know, that all of those things pointed to the work that he was going to do, uh, you know, he, he would have diverted his plan, but he didn't know that all of these things were pointing to one Messiah, that in one, one, that all of these things were gonna be accomplished. And so he hid himself. And so, so for him to hide himself in the work that he done, I mean, it's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. So then he comes and he finishes his work and then he begins to now reveal to us who, what he did <laughs> and open up our minds to the work that he has done for us and is going to do. And now we have to trust him by, by faith. And so when we start trusting him by faith, then he opens up our minds to see him in all those things. You know, I was reading in the uh, book, uh, Second Ezra, uh, the other day about how he was saying, you know, he told him to write all these books. I can't, I can't remember now how many it was. But it seemed like it was well over 100 books. But he told him, but set these to the side for the, for the faithful. He said, and just give everybody these. <laughs> You, you get what I'm saying? So everybody can't get the revelation, but I'm going to let them have this right here. This, you know, you know, to, so they'll have something, you know, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to preserve these over here for the faithful. So he, he does that, you know, he does it by his own, own will, how he wants to do it, who he wants to reveal it to by his foreknowledge. So it's, it's, it's an awesome thing uh, to begin to understand things about him you know, uh, to have these difficult questions answered because that is a difficult question about uh, the trial, trial nature uh, of, of Yah. And nobody explains it in, in, the, in the church. You know, nobody explains it, it's, 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 you know. And so and it's, it's, it's amazing to me. All right, Ms. Pitts. Um, well, I'm glad you just said that because I guess I don't have the revelation yet. I'm still with everybody else, but I'm glad that they're asking these questions because um, I, I guess I'm, you know, Yahshua always prays to Yah, so I'm like, um, you know, he's saying um, Father, and then there are other references in the Bible when he's saying no one is greater than the Father, or there's only one that's good, and that's the Father, so I guess my understanding, I'm not, maybe I'm not clear on what be well, think, is, think about it like think about it like this okay he came down to do a work right okay so was there i mean while he was in the flesh was there a guarantee from this is how he's looking at it. is there a guarantee that i'm not going to mess up think about it like that so and the re while he was in the flesh he knew that he had a weakness and he had the potential to mess up because this flesh had messed everybody else up. 
there was not one person that hadn't been messed up by the flesh. Millions of people had come to the earth from Adam all the way to Christ. And not one person had, had, had not been messed up by the flesh, not one. He said, he said, he said, uh, we're all guilty, all of us. So Yeshua comes to the earth in our form and he's paying homage to, uh, his, you know, his father, the pure one, because he's in the flesh and he's saying, I'm going to, you know, there's no variance in my father's thinking. He's not being influenced by the flesh. I am. So I'm going to submit myself to him and listen to what he's saying. Because if I listen to myself sometime, I might mess up. So that's why he says stuff like there's none good but the father. Because he's saying, I haven't finished my work yet. I can mess up tomorrow. There's none good but the father. But when he was completely done with his work and it was proven that he didn't mess up either while he was in this flesh, then the father elevated him higher <laughs> than anybody else because now he can say that he's as good as the father y'all y'all get what i'm saying because he's sitting now in his place again but while he was in his flesh he couldn't say that because he had to humble himself because he knew that just like everybody else had messed up he had the potential to mess up and so he didn't want to do that and he said the only way to do that is to humble myself to uh you know to my father but he never thought that he wasn't uh that he wasn't God, that never, that never was okay. an issue for him. Okay, and just two more quick things, and I guess that's it for me. But then, um, okay, how it says, like, now he was raised, and now he sits on the right hand of the Father. What does that mean? If he's on the right hand, I guess I'm confused about that. And then the second one, because um, when you referenced um, I know it does say that no one has ever seen the father, but doesn't in John like five, um, it also says no one has heard the father's voice. Can you clarify that as well? I haven't read five the, and 37. I had to go look at that one of John and five and 37 because we heard the father's voice in the wilderness. So I had to look at that verse and try to try to look at it right well i know that he spoke with moses so i thought right. but i think john john chapter 5 verse 37 does say no one has ever heard the father's voice okay yeah we have to look look that up let's let's hit your original one first you, you got me with that one uh your original one uh, go back to your first question that you asked about the, well, okay, okay about the right about hand him okay. sitting on the right hand and okay yeah the, okay so we got the right hand okay so we really had to get in, into depth about the fallen angels and listen we, we get into some deep stuff and i tell people to, to eat eat what if especially if you're newer eat what you can eat you know and and spit out the rest and because you're not going to get it all at one time it's just not it's too much all right so um but when we start talking about the right hand and we start studying the angels and the fallen angels and those who are with Yah and those who are not with Yah, all right, the angels that are on the right hand are those that are faithful to him. And those who are on the left hand are those who are not. When you study, go through scripture and you see Satan, Satan is always standing at his left hand. Okay. And that's why he says stuff like, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So when Yeshua goes back and he sits down at the right hand of his father, not only is he sitting at the right hand elevated mm -hmm. with the same height, but he's, he's given all authority to that one that's sitting at his right hand. So that's what the right hand means. The left hand is, is, is uh, you know, in the imagery of the kingdom uh, are those on the left hand that's, you know, that, that's doing the, the, the evil bidding so, or whatever. So we, we, could, we could get in that. Um, all right, so let's look at John, you said 5 and 27. Chapter uh, 5, verse 37. Well, let's back up and make sure we get all this in context. All right, so they were upset that Jesus cured the man on the Sabbath. And they said, it's not lawful. All right. And he answered, he that made me hold the same sin to me, take up my 
my bed, thy bed and walk. And then they asked him, what man is it which said to thee, take up thy bed? And he, and he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away. Multitude in that place. All right. Uh, so he was healing. They were getting mad and they sought to kill him because he was healing folks on the Sabbath. I had to read in context. I, I just can't look at a scripture. And, all right. Uh, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. I appreciate you looking into it. Yeah, for the Father loved the Son and showed him all things that himself do it, and he showed him greater works than these that you may marvel for his Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not, not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. Very last say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that I was come and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father had life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can and, uh, and I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of the Father which has sent me. All right. All right, now what verse are we trying to get to? Okay, 30, 37. Uh, you sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth, but I received not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice, but I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to finish the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me, yet have neither heard his voice at any time nor ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his abiding in you, for whom he has sent him, ye believe not. Now, when I'm reading this, he's not talking to everybody. He's talking to the, the people that he's having the conversation with. And he's telling them because they're upset about how he's doing things with the Sabbaths and all these things. He's talking directly to them and telling them that you haven't seen or heard the father's voice. I have. So he is, this is not doctrinal in the sense that he's saying none of, no, nobody has ever. That's not the statement that's being made there. He's not saying nobody has ever. He's telling those specific people that they have not heard the voice of the Most High. And so they can't make the judgment that they're making because they haven't heard him. He's saying, I'm hearing him all the time. I'm his son. So, uh, yeah, so that's not what he's, he's not saying that nobody has, uh, has heard it. Okay. Thank you. For all right. Um, Mr. Hudson. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so the, uh, one of the, one of the things that I, I was, um, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with is when and then going back to the scripture um, um, in Matthew uh, 5, 43 to 48, where he's saying, um, you have heard it. You have heard that it was said to love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm having a tough time with that, trying to understand. Um, who is being referenced in this? Was it the unsaved Hebrews or the ones who split, like talking about from the north and this, the north and southern kingdom, or is he talking about everybody who is against God? All right, let's make sure we get that in context too. Matthew five. All right. 
you know, because you know, you, you, in in trying to uh, understand, you know, what is what is being said, and um, by that, you know, that term enemy. Yeah, he's talking to pretty much, he was talking to that crowd, but this is one of those that carry on to everybody. And it, it's a tough word. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I, I'm trying to understand what you know, when he says love your enemies. I mean, I know the thing wrong. I pray for the people that, you know, so what, do different how, things. Define but love. I, define yeah. love to me. Yeah. Define. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of love and willing to sacrifice yourself for them. Well, you know, I'm I, and I'm not going and I'm and I'm not, you know, to be honest, I'm not willing to jump in front of a bullet for them versus my family that I'd love. So we had to then find out if that's what he mean by. OK, you know, yeah, uh, you know. That's what that's what that's what we got to do, because that's not that's not that's not my imagery of what he's saying. OK. To, to you know what love is um, you, you know when we start talking about love he he describes he he describes what love looks like he starts saying that the stuff like love is patient you know and, and, mm -hmm. and kind and and stuff so it, you know can you can I be patient with somebody you know i mean to because it's it's a it's almost ex extreme to go from just being nice to somebody Mm -hmm. and, and 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 now you're giving up your life <laughs> right I, so I, I don't think that he's going going there to ask us to do do that without first saying well can you just be nice to him <laughs> I understand. you know what i'm saying so if i can't even get to the point that i could just be be in the room and just be kind then mm. the the life thing is off the table that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's not even the issue, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, I'm dealing with my enemies every day and I found that, you know, if, if I, if I come to them, if I respond to them in a kind manner, mm -hmm. it, it, it does what the scripture said, heaps coals of fire on their head. <laughs> you know okay. i i had to trust that i mm -hmm. also i also have to trust that all things are working together for my good i, I can't see it but i got that's what we were talking about with yeshua i, I got to trust him you know that all things are, are working together so even when he asked me you know love my enemies uh you know a lot of times loving our enemies is really going to pull something off of you in obedience that you're not even realizing is going to get pulled off of you. Hmm. You know, because if, if we keep, if we keep coming at our enemies a certain way, um, the scripture is clear. It says, you know, if, if we follow the Lord, the way we're supposed to, he said, I, I even make your enemies be at peace with you. Uh -huh. Okay. But if I don't, then, you know, there's going to be occasions where, uh, you know, my enemy could, you know, support me in an area, but because of how I'm responding, you know, they might not if I'm responding in disobedience. So th the idea then is to begin to trust him even in those type of situations because he asked me to, mm -hmm. even, even though I don't want to, even though I don't like them, can I do it? And then he said, well, how do you do that? He said, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it requires a relationship. It mm -hmm. requires effort for me to go back to him and say, Lord, I, I'm having a hard time with this. You're going to have to help me. And I, I wonder sometimes by myself about, about the effort that I put in. Do I do this is tough. So I had to fast for a couple of days. This is tough. So I, I'm going to have to pray always, you know, 
you know, you know, he said, put on the whole arm of God, you know, put on the heaven of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, gird yourself up, your loins up, uh, you know, and, you know, put preparation of peace with your feet and all this type of stuff. And he said, you know, just to be able to stand. All right. Mm -hmm. Having, then he says, having done all to stand. Okay. So I find myself in situations at times and I say, have I done all to stand? Uh -huh. Or did I just reach a limit that I don't like? And I say, I don't want to do this. <laughs> it's, it's a difference. It's a difference between having done all to stand. So I had to, I had to evaluate myself. And, and, and when he said, having done all just to stand in this situation, have I fasted? Did I pray about it? Uh -huh. You know, did I keep my voice calm? I mean, what did, did I do all to stand? And you say, well, how can I do that? Because I have to get strength from the most high to contain this flesh. Have I done all to stand? And, uh, you know, so that's what our reward is based upon. How much am I willing to give up? How far am I willing to go? Because we all going to hit a brick wall. And it's mm -hmm. always going to be somebody that's going to, I mean, it's, it's always going to be somebody. And you say, I ain't, no, I ain't, I'm, nope. And the most high is going to ask you, how far are you willing to go? And how far are you willing to go and how far I'm willing to go is going to determine what our reward is. And if I look at somebody and I say, I don't like this person so much that I'm going to allow them to mess up my reward. Even though Paul said, let no man beguile you into losing your reward. Mm -hmm. And we got to choose, you know. Uh, so it's that man. That's that's tough. I know it's tough, but I, I that's all I can tell you. Is, 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 <laughs> thank you, like, thank you. You know, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, these are the choices that we gotta make. Can I love? Can I love my enemies? In other words, can I be? He, he describes love. And he said, "Love is patient. Love is kind." Uh, you know, all those type things. It's not the first step. Is not to, you know, put put your life on the line. And, and destroy yourself for them. It just, can you just, you know, if, okay, let's say if somebody offended you, uh, can I treat them as if I'm not offended? Mm -hmm. Or do mm -hmm. I have to do little stuff to let them know I'm still mad at them? You right. know, you know, I, 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 I you know, I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it in a way to let them know, you know, you know, sometimes even in marriage, you know, yeah, they mad at you, but then they come to you, well, you want something to eat? You know, well, okay, yeah, I do want something to eat, but did you have to come at me that way? You know, because they letting you know that I'm still mad at you, but I'm going to go ahead and fix you something to eat anyway. See, it, it, so you're letting me know that you ain't let this thing go. So sometimes we do little things like that to let the person know I'm not over it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do it anyway. So can I approach that person and they not know I'm not over it, but still be kind and patient? That's love. It's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Right. Love is operating in the spirit of God, even though your flesh is telling you not to. That's love. Mm -hmm. Love is being in excruciating pain on the cross, saying, my God, my God, why is that? Why are you forsaken me? Looking at the very people you're trying to say that wagging their heads and shaking their heads at you, you know, uh, the, the having been whipped to the point where your organs are showing, mm -hmm. and still say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Now, now he was yeah. feeling. He was feeling a certain way. You, you can't tell me he wasn't feeling something, some kind of way. <laughs> but, but love yes. was not love was not his feeling. So mm -hmm. separate your feeling from what you do in the spirit. Um, regardless of how I feel about this, I'm going to respond the way the Most High want me to respond, and that's what Yeshua did. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Our feelings be messing us up, y'all. We think that our feelings, no lie. yeah, I feel it. We think that our feelings mm -hmm. are the are the control is the controlling factor. Paul said, "Man, it was times in my marriage I felt like I wanted to die," but he said, "You know what? I ignored myself and I trusted, not in how I was feeling, but I trusted in the words of the Most High." 
can we separate our work and for the most high from our feelings? Yes. Because I know some of y'all didn't feel like getting on here tonight, right? But you did it anyway. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so, I mean. You ain't our enemy, though. <laughs> Right, I understand, I understand, but, but I'm just saying fighting your feelings. I, I bless you, Hank, I appreciate it. But y'all y'all know what I'm saying. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. That, okay, yeah, I, I didn't mean to go on that. Really, no, no, it, it was really needed for me. Yeah, yeah. so hang in there, we all struggling with it, I promise you I am. I, uh, uh, tonight, before I go to bed, I'm saying, Lord, you know these folk crazy. I gotta go. <laughs> I'm telling. I, yeah. I promise. I'm. 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 I'm just being honest with you because I want you to be encouraged. I'm gonna tell them and say, you know, they feel crazy. You know, they got a plot waiting on me when I get there. If you could just tomorrow, just could you just go ahead of me and foil every plan and plot that they got waiting for me, uh -huh. and, uh, and give me the strength to be able to get through this thing today. You know, that's gonna be my prayer because I already know they got a plan. Uh -huh. I'm already feeling some kind of way about going in, but I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go in anyway. Y'all, y'all get what I'm yes, saying? Yes, so, yes. Yeah, just keep on walking, brother. Thank you, thank. Because yeah. I ain't gonna lie. So sometimes I'll be like, Lord, like you, like David said, let me know when I can pay my enemies back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I may throw in, Lord, Lord. I, I pray for them to try to come into the saving knowledge of you, Amen. But I didn't mean that part. I ain't gonna lie. I didn't mean. I don't, but you got. I want to. Yeah. I want to, but I didn't. Yeah. Just confess that to him, though. That's the thing about it. confess yeah. it to him and say, "I'm not meaning it. I need you to help me mean it." Okay. And he will. You'll get to the point where you actually mean it. That you can mean it when you say it. You know. So that's important. All right. Let's get some other questions before we before we get out. That was good. That was good. All right. So uh, who is the Vera? I'm here. Okay. Okay, so I've been studying Matthew uh, about Yeshua saying, my God, Matthew, what is it, uh, 27, 45, and 46. Mm -hmm. And he's, and when he said, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabatani, mm -hmm. my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so I, the whole thing I was looking into, and ah, I'm gonna cut it short because there's a lot in that, a lot. And I have a lot of scriptures, Amos 8 and 9, Mark 15, 33, just, just for references. Acts 3, 1, I mean, I'm sorry, yes, 3 and 1, and then Acts, I think it's 1, 15, uh, 2, 15. But what all of that is saying, including Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews, in the, if you read it from the Amplified Version, Hebrews chapter 13, part B of that statement, in chapter 13, verse 5, part B, he says, I will, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will, I will not, I will not, I will not. He said it three times. In any degree, leave you helpless or forsake you. And I'm saying all that because when, and I've been really, really, really doing an in-depth study on that scripture. Um, why Yeshua said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me when he was all God? He was an old man. And he knew his purpose for being here. He said many times, when you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I and the Father are one. The main thing that came to my spirit was that that was not blood covenant talking. And Yeshua was heavy into blood covenants. So I went in my searching, I came across this book called Idioms in the Bible Explained. I'll show you, shall I show you a picture of it? You want to hold it up? Okay. Anyway, it says, idioms in the Bible explain and key to origin gospels. Uh, in that, I'm trying to say this as quickly as I can. Here's the book. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Have you heard of that book? No, I haven't heard of that one. Okay. It's, the book is by George M. Lamas. And in the book, as I'm reading it, it says, <laughs> Matthew 27 and 45. 
Yeshua never said those words, what my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the reason he didn't say that, because he knew his, he knew why he came here. He knew his purpose. Yes, his flesh had him hurt. He was wounded. He was bruised for our iniquities, all of that. But when he was on that cross, that ninth hour, the God in him came out. And he said, my Elohim, my Elohim, for this I was kept or spared. This was my destiny. I was born for this. He, Jesus did not quote Psalms 22, as everyone would say they did. When you look at it, because he was speaking Aramaic, if he had, if we would, if he would have said these words in Hebrew instead of Aramaic, he would have said, and it would have been translated from the Hebrew, and he would have used the term nashatini, N-A-S-H-A-T-A-N-I, nashatini which means forsaken me. But instead, he spoke in Aramaic because of the, as you were saying, it was about the, it was all about the crowd. There I am. I'm sorry, I wasn't on the phone. It was all about the crowd that was standing around him. So he spoke in Aramaic and in Aramaic, it made a big difference. He said that, uh, um, instead of saying natachani, which means forsaken me, he says sabatani, which means kept me. So, um, okay, but that's, it takes that's interesting. Of, yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, 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 very, very interesting. He said, "For this you have kept me. For this I was spared. This is my destiny, because he knew what he had to do was die for us, and he understood blood covenant." For God to break the blood covenant, somebody that would be a that would like be like a curse. So because they under the covenant, when we study the blood, we understand that you can't break that blood covenant, and God would never break the, His covenant. But I'm still in the studying stage of it, so I just wanted to share that with you. All right, yeah, that's good. We'll have to look into that a little bit, a little bit more. So. Look into because it's Aramaic. He was speaking Aramaic because of the crowd, like you said, the crowd that was around him. When Matthew wrote this scripture, he was the, in a different crowd than when Jesus spoke about what he was doing. Matthew, of course, you know, Matthew, the book of Matthew is like old covenant anyway, because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So it's still under the old law, old covenant. But after he died on the cross, that's when the new covenant kicked in. So I just wanted to share that a little bit. All right. Yeah. That would be a that would be a project for us to look into. All right. Good good stuff. All right. Uh let's see who's next. Um, um was it Corey or was it um let's see who all got there? Okay, yeah, go ahead uh, um go ahead, Miss uh why am I forgetting your name today? <laughs> uh, your sister-in-law just spoke. Go ahead and talk. <laughs> Marvell. No, I mean, <laughs> my mind is bad right there. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I found the damn hit my head, so I don't know how much going to be going and missing in a minute. It's already half gone, I think. I don't know. But anyway, um, I was listening to one of the young man who was talking about um, about the you know how Christ was born. Uh, what did he say? I, I can't remember exactly what he was saying, but anyway, it has something to do with him being a uh, God and man. How was that? Does anybody remember what he was saying? I can't think of his name because I can't see it. I'm using my doggone phone. And I'm uh, But I wanted to comment on the, um, about the birth of Jesus. When a woman, like when a woman has a, uh, has a child, because if you go back and read the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, 
or uh, uh, any of them. They'll tell you about his birth and how the Holy Spirit came up, came over her and that she conceived the Holy Spirit, which was the God, God himself. That's why we say God, Father God, mm, Oh God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came up on her, or the angel of God came up on her, however, whoever it was. Um, not, I don't have my book Bible in front of me. However, he came up on her. It had to be one of the Godheads. I like that's what I do know. And and she conceived. And she was what Jesus was taught, uh, what God was telling at, uh, Satan at the beginning that she was going to concede. And it's just like a natural woman have, you know, you can imagine a woman having a son uh, of her father that she's married. It was, she didn't, the seed did not come from Joseph. So when you start reading what he taught today, just go back and let the spirit of God show you these things so that you can get a better understanding of what he's talking about. Because this is, this is uh, deep stuff in the word. This is really good word. And it's for, you know, for those who are, who are interested in learning, but it's a lot of reading you have to do to make sure that you get a, and uh, understand everything you're reading. And when you have questions, you know, write them down so that they can be answered. But you have to do a lot of research with this. Yeah. And then the thing about it is you don't want to get frustrated. I mean, because we are covering a lot of, and we had, we had to understand that everybody's at a different place. So I had to teach on several different levels at one time, right? I have right. to, you know, to be fair to those who are, are at a different level or whatever. So, uh, and then those are those who are just coming in, and then we had to we had to cover the uh, the other things as well. So, I, 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 the way the way I teach, I had to cover the gamut of it so that we can you know continue to progress. And then those who may be a little bit behind, then we can try to catch catch them up. But we're all uh, it's okay, you know. Ask ask whatever questions that you have. Just don't get yeah. frustrated if you don't if you don't have the full understanding this is years of this is years of study years of yeah. you know so it's, it's not gonna come you know you can't you can't come out of the womb eating steak with no teeth <laughs> you, you just can't do it you know you gotta grow into these things right. all right uh so yeah so yeah good good point all right uh we're gonna get Corey, then lewis and then al going back to the garden with Adam. So basically, basically uh, <clears throat> taking, taking from what you was talking about earlier, uh, about the Father, the, the, the Son, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, basically that was Yeshua that was in the garden with Adam, right? Right. right. Okay. That's, that's what yeah. I got. From, that's the understanding I got from that. I just wanted to get a clarification on that. Yes, sir. And so uh, that that's the great thing about it. You know, he was the one that would always show up, you know, on the scene. And, uh, you know, he would show up in the, you know, the Bible uses, you know, the messenger or angel a lot of times because he hadn't been born yet. So that's why people use the word pre-incarnate uh, and all that type stuff. But, uh, yeah, that was him in the garden. And and he says, uh, you know, he gives clues like, you know, he says he's the word, right? In the in the heavens, you got the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. But then when he came down the garden, you hear, uh, he, he, you know, they call him the voice, <laughs> uh, the voice of of Yahweh's, you know, speaking. So yeah. what's the voice of Yahweh? It's the Word, you know. So it's the spoken word. So he he uses the imagery there to get us to understand that. Yeah. Uh, who did I say? Uh, was it Al? Yeah. So, uh, Kendall, I, it was so just circling back to to what we had talked about a little bit earlier and kind of put a fine point on it. So, is the relationship between father and son genuine, although they have equal power and status? Is that what the conclusion is of that matter? 
Uh, is it genuine? Is it, yeah, I mean, it's it's genuine. Uh, the father acknowledges that he sent that part of himself to uh, judge us and to be among us. So he gives him all authority in that area because he was the one that actually experienced it. If that makes sense. So that was. So yeah, they they're equal though. They're all equal because they're all one. Yeah, they just that that makes sense. They're all one. You know. Yeah, it's, I know it's difficult to, to get. It took years to make sense to me, too. So, uh, Lewis? Yes, sir. Um, shalom, everybody. Shalom. And shalom. I could tell you, man, I, I certainly appreciate being a part of this call. And, you know, it just, it's a lot of information. So I just wanted to tell you thank you because, you know, you just don't hear this in your average church on a Sunday. So it just makes so much sense and it's, it's really deep. But uh, my question is, I noticed earlier when we were talking about how he will bring us in on eagle's wings. Um, in the book of Isaiah, I believe is chapter 11, I think it says in verse 14, it says, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Is that kind of talking about the same thing with the eagles? I believe because, I, I believe it is, yeah. Yes, and, sir. Mm hmm yeah, when we because get into I was other books that. too. Yeah, when we get into other books, it talks about actual, you know, angels like with eagles' wings bringing us out. But go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go yes, ahead. Yes, sir. And I was, I was wondering that because it seemed like it could be talking about it, but I really wasn't sure. And you know, it was telling. It was also saying a couple verses ahead, like I think it might be the 13th verse. Well, actually to start where it said, um, the 11th verse, it said, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be for left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, and from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He shall set an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel they gathered together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth right. and the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off and Ephraim shall not vex Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. What does that actually mean? Ephraim and Judah vexing each other. Well, I mean, it, it goes back to the division the of the uh, Northern kingdom and Southern kingdom. Uh, Ephraim is is often a uh, euphemism for the northern kingdom, and then you got Judah. So he's talking about bringing the the two sticks of Israel back, the whole house of Israel back together. So uh, oftentimes he'll, he'll use the, the Ephraim as the as the um, euphemism for that. So he's talking about nor the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Yes, sir, and. Um... When he talks about the enemies of Judah and coming from the West, so who would they be talking about the Philistines as we think of the Philistines during the time of Goliath and Gath and all them? Or is yeah. he talking about like the Philistines, which might be in a different nation of today or something? Yeah, for like the most, most part, people are kind of still in the areas that, but, uh, that they are in you know, uh, descendants and stuff like that. So, yeah, he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, the descendants of those those people, I believe. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And then he's, because he's, still, and he's talking about that same land area too. So. Yes, sir. And you, you're, you'll see that he keeps naming the same enemies over and over and over again. So it's kind of, it's kind of amazing to, to see. But he's he's given us, and and hopefully we, you know y'all will and we'll we have opportunity. He's given us a sequence of the battles that we're going to be fighting uh, once we come back into uh, the uh, you know in the wilderness. So uh, you know 
he he puts Edom last. Edom is is the last battle, right? And so we know that uh, we know that you know you can't read you can't read the things about Edom and not know. And then he said he's going to use our hand to defeat Edom. You know, so there's a war that's going to happen, and we're going to defeat our enemies one by one. Even in the book of Ezekiel, he goes by one by one. He starts naming the nation. And he said he's going to turn his, you know, uh, you know, turn his wrath toward each nation. And he's, he goes one by one. And then he goes to Egypt and then he goes to, uh, you know, another nation. And then he goes, he just, it, it's just a, it's a course of events that's going to take place for these battles that we're going to fight. And I'll see if I can pull up some more writings, especially from the, um, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they talk about it too, that there's an order of events that's, that's going to happen in these wars. Yes, sir. Um, the reason I mentioned that was also because are they still the, like the Philistines being maybe another nation or went out into other nations? I only mentioned that because, you know, with Edom, for example, it said in Genesis that when it named their generations or whatever, it's called them the Dukes of Edom. So when you look at that word Duke and you look at the nations that claim, you know, to have that title Duke, you know, it kind of, I noticed mostly only European nations, like even with uh, WW2, they call Benito Mussolini the Duke or something like that. So all the European nations seem to cling to that title. So would Edom be considered not necessarily what we think of today from a biblical perspective near the Red Sea, but would it be talking about like Europe more well, so? Well, Edom, you know, when, when you look at the kingdoms, when you start looking at the, at the kingdoms, you know, and it talks about mystery Babylon and all this, Edom, has expanded his kingdom outward. You know, he mixed in with the uh, with uh, with Kittim. He, you know, he mixed in with uh, you know the sons of uh, you know and daughters of Japheth. So, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. It could be the, you know the expanded kingdom that he has out there that we're going to end up you know fighting. But the thing about it is that la those last wars, he's going to pull them all to one location. They're going to start coming down to destroy us and they're going to be meeting us in those areas. You get what I'm saying? Israel's not going to have to go up to England and, and Great Britain and, and Russia and they come into us. So, um, so, so once we understand the sequence and the battle and all that, they're coming our way. We're going to be in the land. We don't have to worry about Philistines. They're going to come to us. We don't have to, <laughs> you know, they're all going to be trying to destroy us. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how that's going to go. But yeah, you're right that Edom is, has spread himself out. Rome has spread itself out. Babylon, by another name, has spread it, itself over uh, over the world. And just like in the past, you had the kingdom of Babylon, which encompassed a large landmass. You had Syria that did the same thing. Persians did the same thing. They encompassed more than just that one little uh, country. Yes, sir. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's about it um, for today. That was that was a lot of good questions and a lot of deep stuff. Uh, that's all right. And see, what I like about hitting things that you don't understand, the only one that can make you understand is the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have to go to him and say, Lord, I don't understand <laughs> what that man just said tonight. <laughs> and he's going to see whether or not you seek him for understanding. That's the test. Lord, help me to understand. Yes. And then I go back to him and he don't reveal it right off. He give me something that I didn't think he was going to give me. And then I go back again. Lord, I don't understand. Show me. He's a reward of them that diligently seek him. And just listening to me is not diligently seeking him. It's, it's a great start, but you got to do some things on your own so that he can deal with your mind and all that and, and prepare, get that ground. He had to go out and get that fallow ground. You know, got to dig that ground up to prepare it, to drop them seeds in there. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So you can develop some growth. So right now, 
some of us are on fallow we on fallow ground. We're getting we're getting scuffled up a little bit. That's all right. This is the opportunity right here to go and and establish their relationship with most high and say, I don't understand. Show me. And anybody that's get get understanding, that's what they do. That's part of the journey. So don't get discouraged. You know, if you don't understand, chew what you can chew, spit out the rest, come back to the table tomorrow. You'll get hungry again. Everybody in here, you know, sit down at their table every day and eat. You can't eat enough on Sunday to get you through next year. You got to come back to the table again and eat again. So Amen. Keep, keep eating. Keep eating. All right. Let's Amen. pray. Kendall, uh, yes. I just, I just had a quick question. If we can, we can put it off until next week. Uh, the uh, I, I know don't know who you were talking about. Um, uh, talking with, uh, but it was about loving your enemies or whatever. Was it enemies or was it um, uh, uh, loving your neighbor? I, I I don't know if it was Al or Lewis. It was enemies. It was it was, it was enemies. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, so let's say a prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for this opportunity, Father. We want to thank you, Father, for, uh, you know, giving us the, the drive to seek you more. Uh, we know that that's a blessing that comes directly from you, Father. We ask you to open up everyone's heart and everyone's mind in this group that's seeking you, that's looking for answers. Uh, you said that you were rewarded them that diligently seek you, Father, and I believe that. I stand on that right now, and I know I have two or three people that agree with me that, Father, if we seek that, we're going to find it. If we ask it to be given, and if we keep on knocking, Father, that you're going to open that door to us. And so we're, we're, we're banking on that. We're expecting that. That's our hope. And we just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity, knowing that it's not that we got to come out, but we get to come out. And the fact that we get to come out means that you have given us the liberty to seek you right now. And knowing that those doors are going to close one day where the liberty will be gone. And Father, we just want to thank you for opening it up to us right now, giving us the opportunity to seek you and to be at your feet. We ask you to forgive us for our many sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we want to thank you, Father, for everything that you have given us. Every breath we take, every heartbeat we know is limited. Every sound that we hear, every taste that we have, Father, we know it comes directly from you. And we just want to say thank you in your son Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Shalom, everybody. Yeah. Shalom. 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 Thank you.